Hello friends, have you seen Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dream Game? I get to see it, but I would love to one day. And I was fascinated to discover uh, a couple of weeks ago that the musical began as a one-off 15 minute show in 1968. Andrew Lloyd Webber, Webber's father uh, was a friend of the, the head of music at a school in London and they wanted a religiously themed performance to be part of an end of term event. And so Joseph, uh, as we know it now, uh, was performed. But jo Andrew Lloyd Webber's father was in the audience and he felt that there was a lot of potential in this 15 minute show that he'd just seen. So he suggested to his son and Tim Rice that they expand and revise it. And they did. So a couple of weeks later, they performed it again. Uh, it was increased to 20 minutes. And then shortly afterwards, they did another performance. It was 35 minutes. And the rest is history. And it's grown into this huge uh, phenomenon. Um, and I was fascinated again to discover that it spawned sort of 20,000 plus theatre and school productions. The 12-year the tour that it did under the directorship of Bill Kenwright got the musical into the Guinness Book of Records. That famous song, Any Dream Will Do, uh, it won Broadway Song of the Year in 81 and 10 years later it won an Iva Novella Award. Um, and all of this shows what how Joseph's story resonates with so many people, but it also resonates with people as, as they come to the scriptures. And as we continue, or as we begin our journey through the Bible and we focus on Genesis, I'd like to spend some time looking at the story of Joseph. It takes up a huge portion of Genesis. And I hope that what I'm going to share with you today will be of some help and encouragement to you. And as uh, this week, uh, all of the readings will be focused on Joseph. So maybe this will be just a nice introduction to that as well. But before I delve into some points of application, let's provide an overview of the story of Joseph. Now, best place to begin is with Jacob. Now, Jacob, uh, he has 12 sons with four different wives, including Rachel. Now, Rachel is his favourite wife, and it's with Rachel that he has his two youngest sons, Benjamin and Joseph. And these two are sort of the apples of Jacob's eyes, especially Joseph. Um, and that's perhaps where we get uh, the, uh, that fa where the fabled coat comes in. And unsurprisingly, the favouritism shown to Joseph and Benjamin is a source of friction between them and their older brothers. And Joseph is a little bit tactless and, and he heightens these tensions by sharing details of a couple of dreams that he feels that God has given him, which suggests that one day Joseph will rule over them. This infuriates the brothers and they decide to kill him. Uh, thankfully, Reuben, one of the brothers, comes to his senses and he says, look, we can't kill our own flesh and blood. Let's leave him in a pit. Um, and in his own mind, he's thinking, I'll come and pick him up later and I'll take him home. So the brothers agreed to this until Judah spots some Midianite traders and he has an idea. Let's profit from our brother's misfortune. And, and that's what happens. They sell him to uh, the, Mid the Midianite traders who in turn sell him to slavery into Egypt, where he's picked up by Potiphar. And he was an official of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Um, now, meanwhile, um, so this happens and Reuben, he mustn't have been part of this latter discussion because he goes to the pit to pick up Joseph, thinking he'll be there, but he's not there. And he fears the worst. And so he goes back and he, he shares news with fa his father, Jacob, um, who was distraught at this, the apparent death of his favoured son, Joseph. Now, meanwhile, in Egypt, Joseph, he's in slavery, but, but as, as much as, as well as he can do, he's, he's, he's doing OK. You know, he's winning the favour of those he's working for. He wins their respect. He's given a fair amount of responsibility. But things take a bit of a turn for the worse because Potiphar's wife takes a shining to handsome Joseph and makes a few advances towards him. Now, he wisely uh, rebuffs these to the point where he, at one episode he runs away. Um, but Potiphar's wife spurned is 
she's embarrassed by this and she turns the tables and says actually Joseph made unwanted advances on her and this gets Joseph in prison where he was for at least two years and again it's it's hard surroundings but as much as he can he, he does pretty well there he, he's given responsibility by the prison warders they clearly like Joseph and give him responsibility uh, the king's cupbearer and baker they clearly commit an offence. They're in the prison. They have some dreams. Joseph interprets them for them. Um, and it is this, actually, that gets Joseph an audience with the king, because the king has had a couple of dreams himself and, he's, himself, and he's troubled by them. And he's like, who can help me interpret these dreams? And the cupbearer is like, I know someone. And so Joseph gets an audience with the king. He explains what the dreams mean. He says, look, Egypt is going to get seven years of plenty, but it's going to be followed by seven years of famine. But to survive during the famine, you need to hold reserves during the seven years of plenty. And Pharaoh is quite taken aback by Joseph. You know, he sees that Joseph is a clever, skilled man and, and wise. So he gives him a job. In fact, he promotes him to prime minister. And he's about age 30 when this happens. So from the prison to the palace. And we have the seven years of plenty. And then comes the famine. And a couple of years into the famine, some visitors arrive from Cana and Joseph recognises them, his brothers. Now, his brothers don't know that it's Joseph who's prime minister. And it's here that we begin to see the fulfilment of those dreams many years previously. But whilst the brothers don't know that they are dealing with Joseph, Joseph decides to turn the tables on his brothers a little bit. And this is an vengeful act. There is thought, there is reason to what he is doing here, what God is doing, because he wants to test the brothers, to see that they have changed, have learned from their mistakes. And so he starts by um, sending the brothers on the way, but he, he keeps Simeon, one of the brothers with him. And he says, look, I'm going to keep hold of Simeon until you bring your brother Benjamin to me. Remember, Joseph has a special affection for Benjamin because he was the other son of Rachel. And uh, he sends him away, but he plants some money in the sacks. And when the brothers spot, spot this on the way home, they're like, they realise that, that God is, is convicting them, is showing them that they've done wrong. Because by having money in the sacks and with Simeon being with Joseph, it almost looks like Simeon has been sold into slavery, just as Joseph was by the brothers earlier on. It's mirroring that. And so for the brothers, they're realising, OK, God, what's God doing here? They're, they're, they're recognising that God is trying to get their attention. And so in a panic, they say to their father, Jacob, look, we need to take Benjamin back with us because we don't know what's going to happen. We, we could incur further wrath, wrath from, from Joseph, from God, perhaps. So J uh, Jacob reluctantly agrees, sends Benjamin with the brothers back to Egypt. And when they get to Egypt, they have a good time with Joseph. They have a meal, there's drinking, there's feasting and there's merriment and all of that. And then Joseph sends the brothers away again, but he plants a silver cup. He gets one of his stewards to plant a silver cup in Benjamin's bag. Sends the brothers away with more food for the family, but he sends one of his stewards on ahead of them, who stops the brothers to look for, any, to look for anything suspicious. And they spot the silver cup in Benjamin's bag he's committed this crime and Joseph's like because he's done this I'm going to keep hold of jo keep hold of Benjamin and it is this point that Judah steps to the fore now Judah was the brother that had the idea to sell Joseph into slavery clearly he didn't like his younger brothers those who were fa that were favorite in his father's eyes but he steps in, he provides this speech which indicates that a, a change of heart has happened in him. And indeed, and indeed the whole, all of the, all of the brothers. And this culminates in him offering himself in return for Benjamin. Because he recognises that he can't go back without Benjamin. It would, it would kill his father. His father's already lost Joseph. He can't lose his other favourite son, Benjamin. So Joseph's like, take me instead. And it just indicates that this shift has taken place in his heart, that there is repentance, there is a recognition that they've done wrong. And it is here that Joseph reveals all. He says, look, I am your brother. And there's this wonderful reunion 
Um, that hostility and tension that was there years pre previously has gone. Joseph has seen that his brothers have changed. And the whole family is welcomed into Egypt, where they settle and multiply and the Israelites grow in the land. And that brings us to the end of Genesis. And we have that wonderful verse right at the end, Genesis 50 verse 2. You intended to harm me, but God intended for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And I'd like to focus on two important locations, significant locations in this story, the prison and the palace. You see, the prison, this was the lowest point in Joseph's life. Yes, he went into slavery and it, he was sold there by his brothers. That was bad enough. But then he was put in prison for doing nothing wrong. He was there for at least two years. There would have been some dark moments, some dark days. And then we have him in the palace where it comes with his own challenges. And in the prison and in the palace, Joseph thrived. In fact, he didn't just survive, he thrived. And I wonder if there's some lessons here for us, that whether we're in our own metaphorical prison, that low moment, perhaps the lowest moment in our life, or whether we're in the palace, a high moment where everything's going really well, how can we flourish there and, and everything but in between? What can we learn from Joseph? So let's focus on the prison. And one of the reasons why Joseph thrived in the prison was because God was with him. Genesis 39 verses 20 to 21. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favour in the eyes of the prison warder. You know, we're not told huge amounts of detail of Joseph's time in the prison, but what we are told is significant. And one of them is that God was with Joseph. And no doubt this was a significant reason why Joseph was just proactive in doing as best as he could in those circumstances, knowing that God was with him, would bring him through and would fulfil those dreams that he had. We've just come through Christmas. That reminder that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And it's a message not just for Christmas, but for the whole year. Joshua 1, nine. have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Friends, if we find ourselves in a low moment as we enter this new year, be assured of this, that God is with you. And may that be a source of strength, encouragement and hope. That you will come through. God will pull you through. And one of the ways that we can be reminded of this is, is to look for the blessings, those points of thankfulness and gratitude. In that verse I just mentioned, it said, it said that God showed kindness to Joseph in prison. This would indicate that Joseph saw where God was being kind. Harvard Medical School says this, in positive psychological research, gratitude is strongly and consistently associated with great happiness. Gratitude helps people feel more positive emotions, relish good experiences, improve their health, deal with adversity and build strong relationships. Increasingly, research is revealing just this, that having that attitude of gratitude, despite the circumstances that we're in, can do wonders for our health and well-being. And so look for those points of gratitude, those points of God's kindness. I understand and I, the God understands that it can be difficult to look and see for those moments when things are so tough. But doing so can be can do the wonders for our faith, that assurance that God is still with us and that hope that he will bring us through. And one of the reasons why the Bible tells us to rejoice in all circumstances, first and foremost, it glorifies Jesus. But it also helps us. And there's an interesting dichotomy here, because at the end of this short passage around Joseph in prison, we're told that the cupbearer forgot Joseph. Joseph asked to be remembered when he interpreted the cupbearer's dream, but we're told that Joseph was forgotten. But everything beforehand just radiates this truth that God had not forgotten Joseph, and he's not forgotten you either. Number two, Joseph flourished in prison because he served. 
Uh, so in Genesis 40, verses 6 to 7, um, the cupbearer and the baker, they've come into the prison because they've committed some offence. And they've been they've had these dreams which have troubled them. And it says this, when Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? You know, Joseph's in prison. That's hard enough. This is compounded by the fact that he's done nothing wrong. And yet his eyes are tuned to the pe to people whom he could care for. He reaches out to them. How are you? And uh, what I find quite intriguing about this particular passage is that Joseph provides the interpretation the, for the interpretation for the dreams. For the cupbearer, it's good news. He's, he's going to get released and he'll be fine. For the baker, it's a different story. He's going to die. Joseph effectively delivers a death sentence. You're going to die in three days time. This is a judgment not from God, but Pharaoh. And then we don't hear anything else of Joseph's interaction with the baker. But there were three days. Surely there would have been some dialogue, interaction. And we know Joseph to have been a very caring man, full of integrity. And I think that there is some significance in the fact that perhaps Joseph was the last friend, the only friend maybe, that this baker had. An opportunity for God's grace to reach him at his lowest moment. Friends, in the prisons that we find ourselves in, those low, difficult moments that we find ourselves in, in life, these are opportunities to, to minister to people, to care for people that we might not otherwise have, to reach out to them, even despite our own hardships and difficulty, and say, how are you? And what's, again, another significant side of the story is that Yes, the cupbearer forgot Joseph, but it was the cupbearer who got that audience, that jo Joseph's audience with, the, with Pharaoh. He's like, I know someone who can interpret dreams. And why did he know that? Because Joseph reached out to him when he was sad in prison. This is the turning point in the story and it shifts on a how are you? Joseph just reached out to care to a couple of individuals. And it's that turning point for Joseph going from the prison to the palace. Friends, it is hard to reach out to people when we're in a difficult moment. But boy, can God use that to reach those around us and to bless us in our own lives. Don't underestimate what God can do through that. Through you just reaching out to those that might be within the prison walls that you find yourself in. Jesus said in Matthew 25, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. I mean, it's a, a summary that you could put right on Joseph. He was faithful in the little and God blessed him. Number three, Joseph took the initiative in prison. He said, uh, Joseph says this to the cupbearer after just interpreting his dream. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. You know, Joseph was strengthened by God's presence presence in, in prison and Joseph reached out to those around him but he also saw opportunities to come out of prison to re be released from the low moment that he was in and often there are opportunities there are people that that, that we can take that we can reach out to in our own low moments that will will help ease things for us may even just provide that substantial step out of the difficulties that we find ourselves in. Now, friends, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that getting out of difficult moments is all dependent on what we do. I'm, I'm not getting that at all. But often there are things that we can do that can help ourselves. The trouble is when we're in a difficult moment, we can not have the perspective or the awareness or even the motivation to take those things. Many years ago, I was really low, struggling with loneliness. And I remember chatting to my pastors about this and I just blurted everything out and I was in a difficult moment. And a lot of what people said about loneliness is that to alleviate it or to help alleviate it, you've got to be proactive in reaching out 
to others and, and, and doing things that will help you, whether that's calling a friend for a chat, whether it's signing up for a club, something along those lines. And I was like, I get that, but I can't, I just don't have the motivation for doing it. It's that weird dichotomy of like, I know it's gonna help, but I just don't have the energy to do it. Or I feel fear rejection. But as I began to do it more, it helped so much. I remember calling a friend one moment when I was feeling particularly down and it just did wonders for my well-being. It just lifted me out of a particularly dark day. And so if you're in a difficult time, just look for perhaps where God might be providing opportunities to, to help you. And sometimes he's like, I'm, I'm doing this, it's now your part. I'm reaching out my hand, you need to reach out yours. So there we go, in prison, Joseph not only survived but thrived because God's presence was with him. Joseph served and Joseph took the initiative. So what about the palace? Well, the first thing to say about the palace is that Joseph forgot. And I love this bit because um, and it, it stems from uh, Joseph's children. Well, one particular child. Uh, in Genesis 41 verses 51 to 52. We're told about uh, two children that Joseph had, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Manasseh, uh, it said, the Bible says that it is because, was named because God has made me forget all my trouble and my father's household. And this is quite a statement. You know, Joseph had some tough times. Let's not forget that. Let's not underestimate that. But such was the, the blessing in the palace that he forgot about that. But memories of the past can cloud and hinder our enjoyment of the present. Whether that's fear, it's guilt, it's regret, it's shame. We can sort of cling to it when we're meant to be fully enjoying what God has brought us now. And Joseph's story is a reminder that God often crafts and waits blessings in such a way that they are intended to make us forget what's gone before. That's what God does. That's how sometimes God provides blessings for us. Philippians 3 verse 13 to 14, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the gold to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. Forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead. And a lovely verse in Ecclesiastes 5 verses 19 to 20, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil. This is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. Because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. Friends, God gives us blessings to purposely distract us from work, responsibilities and worries. Crafted in a way, it's like that's God saying that, you're meant to forget this, why are you remembering all of that? Let go and enjoy what I'm giving you now. Because that's what he did with Joseph. And Joseph's like, I'm taking that. So much so that he names his child um, Manasseh to reflect this. Number two, Joseph stored. So um, in Genesis 41 verses 35 to 36, this is after he's interpreted Pharaoh's dreams. Uh, that there'll be the seven years of fam uh, plenty followed by seven years of famine. And he says this, they should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. I was, when I was reading this, I was reminded of a couple of episodes in the, in the last couple of, year, couple of years. At the beginning of the pandemic, everyone rushed to the shops and were t taking all the toilet rolls, you might remember. And then just this past summer, we had that full fuel crisis where cars and lorries queued for miles, I think, to save up for what they would thought would be a time of famine, fuel speaking wise anyway. But there's an important spiritual principle here because... In our seasons of feasting, we must take spiritual nourishment that will help us during famine seasons. We will all have moments of spiritual highs, those times on the mountaintops where our prayers are being, we feel like all our prayers are being answered. We feel God's presence everywhere. Um, 
we're just we're just on that high really and things are going so well but there will be other times when we're in the famine when it's difficult to pray it's difficult to get up and go to church god not only feels distant he feels hostile and one of the key ways that we can survive during those famine moments is to really utilize those moments of spiritual abundance so to to plow into god you know when we're in those spiritual highs it can be really easy to take out our foot off the gas well i'm feeling so good i don't need to go to church or i can take i can reduce my prayer prayer time a little bit or you know i don't need to read the bible as much as i do i'm, I'm feeling good i feel like the lord's with me all the time but these are the very moments we should use our heightened spiritual energy to plow into god to write down what God is doing, to, to jot down the blessings, to, to have reminders of his faithfulness. To keep going to the church meetings, to keep going to church, to keep praying, all of those things. Because when the famine hits, we'll be most much more likely to keep those things going, even when it's hard to do so. It will help sustain us through the moments. But if we let it off during those spiritual highs, we will much more easily fall by the wayside during the famine and it's always worth asking those the question during those heightened moments of spiritual energy and high that you know what's going to help me in the famine what's going to help me in the valley what can I go back to when things are so hard that I that is going to encourage me and, and, and give me some impetus to keep going what will help when the famine comes and the final thing that Joseph did, Joseph did was that he gave. So Genesis 41 verse 57 says this, and all the world came to Egypt to buy from buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere. You know, in our own seasons of abundance, how can we use this to serve others spiritually, materially, financially? You see, the blessing that Egypt enjoyed during those as a result sorry, sorry the, the blessings that the abundance that Egypt enjoyed wasn't just for Egypt it was it was for the whole world that others would be okay as well and similarly the blessings that God gives us are not only for us but others Jesus said freely you have been given freely give that's in Matthew chapter and one of the wonderful things about church is that there will be times when the, the, some will be feeling particularly weak, but others will be feeling particularly strong. And, and it's it, those who are strong can just really help step in and help those that are, are going through a difficult moment. But then on the flip side, when those who are weak are feeling strong, they can then step in to help those who are now feeling vulnerable. So as things are going well for you, just look up at ways that you can use your strength to be a support for those around you, because that is what God would want. The blessing is are not just for you. They are for others. They are for the church. They are for the world. So there we have it, friends. Whether you find yourself in the prison, a particularly, a particularly low moment in life, or perhaps in the palace, or maybe somewhere in between. How is it that you can not just survive in, in those moments, but thrive? Joseph's story is provides guidance on, on how we can do so during those difficult moments, but also during those high moments when it comes with its own temptations. So if in the prison, remember, God is with you. Look to serve those around you and take the initiative to Help yourself during those times where, where those opportunities are. And finally, in the palace, forget well. Store up during those times of spiritual vigour and, and heightened energy. And look for opportunities to strengthen the weak when you yourselves are feeling strong. When you are in the, your own times of abundance. Amen. Let me pray. 
Lord, wherever we find ourselves in at the moment, whether that's in the prison, it's in the palace or somewhere in between, show us, God, what it is that we can do to not only survive during those times, but really thrive. Give us that perspective. Give us that strength. We pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.